Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I am your host, Casey Ruff, and today I am absolutely honored to introduce our guest. Dr. Benjamin Bickman earned his PhD in bioenergetics. He was a postdoctoral fellow with the Duke National University of Singapore studying metabolic disorders. Currently, he is a scientist and professor at BYU in Provo, Utah, where he lives with his family. His focus is to better understand the origins of metabolic disorders with an emphasis on the role of the hormone insulin. He wrote a wonderful book in 2020 called Why We Get Sick, which explores the dangers of insulin resistance. He frequently publishes his research in peer-reviewed journals and presents at international science meetings. Dr. Ben Bickman, absolutely honored. Welcome to the show. Casey, thanks so much. What a fun opportunity. You and I have um, exchanged various brief messages in the past and now we're finally having a chat. It's it's due. It's it's really great. I'm I'm absolutely honored and thrilled to be able to do this with you. I was sitting on my porch um, on Sunday reading your book, and Bethany, my lovely wife, looked over and saw uh, your name, and she said, "Hey, this is the week you're interviewing Ben." And I said, "Yeah, I'm so excited." And she said, "What are you going to talk about?" And I put the book down, and I just open mouth stared at her, and I said, "I don't know. This this one paragraph <laughs> is an hour." This other paragraph yeah. is another hour. I, we could talk about anything. <laughs> indeed, indeed, brother. You could devote an entire career to this sort of stuff and never really get it. Which, which you have and you do get it. <laughs> we well, do- I'm, making a, an, I'm making an attempt, that's for sure. I mean, really, it, it's a, one of the trends I see happening in this immediate moment in time is speak, people speaking of, of science, not that you're doing this and I'm not doing it. We're not doing it now, but people in general in, in the public sphere talking about science as if it is done, it is static. And we believe in, in science. What a, what a dangerous sentiment and wrong. Science is the never ending pursuit of truth. And my realm happens to be the pursuit of truth as we understand it, or, or of, of what we hope are real observations in the realm of the physical or life sciences and, and the idea that science is done and you just believe, no, 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 no. You are constantly trying to show why you're wrong. And, and so I, I, you know, it's, it's not really relevant to the topic at hand necessarily, but I would just say as, as much as I think I've learned, I am, I'm truly ready to ad- admit when I've gotten a conclusion wrong. I, I hope that I can be that humble. And, and I don't mean that in a self-deprecating even a, or aggrandizing sort of way. It, we all ought to be um, humble enough that even when we think we're learning something, we might not really know. So so now at this point, all of your listeners are thinking, well, I'm not listening to this clown. He doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> well, maybe I don't. Well, people get frustrated because we are learning and we do have to walk back some of the things that we thought were true. But you're right. That is science. That's good science. That's what you want. Mm-hmm. I, and so I think that's a really good point. We normally don't start off the show with a listener question, um, but we're going to start the show with a listener question, which is kind of a question mm-hmm. and kind of a statement. Right. I asked somebody close to me if they had a question for you as an insulin researcher. And they said, no, I don't have a question because I don't really I've, like I've heard of insulin. Um, they uh-huh. said... I've always been confused about insulin. I know diabetics take it, but it's like sugar. Yep. So why are they taking it? It just never really made any sense to me. And I said, that is a great listener question and a great place to start. Yeah. I think most people are very confused about it. So can you tell us a little bit about yep. what is the role of insulin? Yeah, yeah, excellent. In, in fact, what that is a great way to start because uh, I will, you know, someone would look at me or look at even the, the premise of my book, uh, as you as you uh, very accurately described it, it, it's generally a book about insulin resistance, but I didn't put that in the title, because I knew the moment someone saw it, they would think, well, that's just relevant to diabetics. So I don't care about that, because I'm not a diabetic, you know, they, that, they may think that. And, and, and that is unfortunate. So insulin is a hormone that is flowing through our blood at all moments, um, every day, every moment of our lives unless we are a type one diabetic, only a type one diabetic, we cannot lump type two diabetes into this um, same definition. A type one diabetic is a disease of not making insulin. And so these are people who must replace what they don't have. And so they take insulin injections for the rest of their lives and live perfectly happy, healthy lives. Um, Although the same rules apply to them as anyone else, they want to try to live a life or in other words, eat a diet that allows them to take as less insulin as possible. And that's certainly one of my central 
um, premises or what people I, I hope would take away from any conversation they hear me in, which is the best way to age well is to keep insulin low. The same thing goes with a type one diabetic. It just can't go too low. It needs to be there. Insulin is a hormone required for life. Um, the theme of insulin is to tell cells what to do with energy. That, that's a general theme or to, to tell cells what to do with nutrients, amino acids, uh, uh, glucose, or, um, or fats. And that part of that then, that definition, my defining it that way, encompasses the most commonly consumed um, uh, view of insulin, which is that it has nothing to do, it has nothing to do with anything else except glucose. That is unfortunate. It's it's not uh, it's not it's simply not accurate and doesn't encompass the magnitude the breadth of what insulin does. But it is true that insulin controls glucose. When someone eats a, eats a starchy, sugary meal, that will um, uh, load the the blood with glucose, where glucose will start to spike. That is a dangerous situation, and I do mean it is uh, frankly lethal. If glucose stays too high for too long. The person will start to leak this glucose into the kidneys and that will pull all of the body water with it from the blood. And the person can die from running out of blood, basically, this hypovolemia. So if, if we keep the glucose too high for too long after indulging in these bagels or donuts, um, then we would die. So thankfully, insulin comes in and it starts pushing that glucose out of the blood into tissues, most especially the muscle. The muscle will consume almost all of that glucose following that meal. It's uh, it's around 80% of all the glucose will go into the muscle, and insulin is responsible for much of that push of, of, uh, of glucose, that movement of glucose. So that's the relevance of insulin with glucose. It is certainly relevant. There's no doubt about it. But it just fails to encompass what insulin does, say, at maintaining neuron structure in the brain or um, maintaining... Uh, joint formation, uh, you know, chondrocyte uh, lifespan at, at joints, or um, maintaining the uh, protein in muscles. Once muscles have made protein, insulin helps defend that muscle protein from getting broken down. So uh, none of those have anything to do with glucose, but they have more to do with insulin simply telling cells, take in nutrients and store them. You know, I, whether it stores them as energetic molecules like uh, glycogen or triglycerides, or whether it's telling the cell to store nutrients as um, uh, future hormones to make hormones from other molecules or to make structural molecules. In other words, telling a cell to take in amino acids and make structural support proteins or, or to make uh, structural or support lipids, you know, fats uh, to help uh, provide structure to the cell or the mitochondria and, and other organelles within the cell. Uh, but again, my long-winded answer to the question is insulin is relevant to um, every cell and it tells every cell what to do with energy. And I do mean every cell, literally every cell in the body. And, and I don't mean that, I'm not using that term as the kids do it these days. I do mean literally Every cell in the body has insulin receptors, which means insulin has an effect on every single cell in the body. Mm. So it's an important hormone. Interesting. And when someone, it, when someone is getting into insulin resistance, now that we've defined the hormone, insulin resistance, as, as it occurs, as we discuss it in a human body, insulin resistance is actually two things. The first is that some cells aren't responding to insulin as well as they were before. For example, the muscle cells, they aren't responding to insulin as well as they were before. And now the muscle cells aren't taking in as much glucose. And so glucose is getting stuck in the blood. And so glucose levels would start to climb over the years. Uh, but at the same time, the other half of the coin known as insulin resistance is that blood insulin levels are elevated, a condition that we call hyperinsulinemia. So in order to understand the relevance of insulin resistance in chronic diseases, such as Alzheimer's, breast or prostate cancer, or erectile dysfunction, or PCOS, whatever it is, to understand insulin resistance role in those disorders, you must understand that it is those two things, the confluence of compromised insulin action at certain cells and hyperinsulinemia. Those two are the pillars of insulin resistance. Interesting. So that's a perfect segue. I have a little list here that I put together, and I do mean this is a little list. I could have gone on and on and on and on, but I'm just going to read these things, and I want to know what is happening in your brain as you hear these things. Type mm -hmm. 2 diabetes, obesity, hypertension, PCOS, 
erectile dysfunction, acid, acid reflux, osteoarthritis, dementia. That's a small list of a lot of different conditions and diseases. What goes through your brain when I read those to you? Yeah, yeah. Frankly, it is it is admittedly the premise of the book, uh, and that is that each of those, as distinct as they may be, they do have at least some common core, um, and which is insulin resistance. To varying degrees, insulin will p- play either a causal or exacerbating role in those diseases. So insulin's either insulin resistance is either outright causing the problem, like it is with um, type two diabetes or polycystic ovarian syndrome or erectile dysfunction, or it's contributing to it, like say it is for certain cancers or, or dementia, uh, Alzheimer's disease. So each and, and that to me, um, so I would want anyone to know who's listening. They may think, "Boy, Bickman, you're really going off the rails here." That's a little too bold. It, it it would be bold if it weren't for the evidence that supports that conclusion. So I'd want anyone to know that I am wholly justified in saying that as bold as it may be, simply because there is significant evidence to support it. And the reason uh, it it should be, to me, wonderful news. It's the good news. It's the gospel of human health. Because if you can acknowledge that many of these seemingly distinct problems do at least have one common thread or underlying it, one common core, a common root, then you address the root If you're worried about the branches of a sick tree, don't prune the individual branches, just cut down the damn tree. And so we have with insulin resistance, if you could imagine a guy who's opening up his medicine cabinet, he's taking one medication for his his type two diabetes. He's taking a medication for his hypertension, a medication for his erectile dysfunction. How liberating would it be for him to realize, wait, all of these are actually related and to varying degrees derivative of insulin resistance. Well, then he asks himself the question, how do I then just address my insulin resistance? And then the next, well, the answer to that question is change your diet. That, I mean, not that I don't want to get ahead of ourselves in the conversation, but back to my point, if we can acknowledge that insulin resistance is relevant to virtually every chronic disease, it gives us a way and and, and is causal then we can address the actual root problem rather than just taking medications that are simply that are going to address symptoms of the insulin resistance. Mm, interesting. So that was something that really surprised me when I was first getting into this. Like I've worked with type two diabetics, and we have definitely gotten them off of insulin, which is which is great. But then to see, mm-hmm. oh, your blood pressure also went down. Your your mental clarity mm-hmm. is way up. There, there's other things that that clear themselves up when you address, you're right, like that root cause, the branch, the, not the branches, the trunk. Yep. Yeah, that's so yep, awesome. That's right. Yeah, that, that, in fact, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. When I see like what you're doing, when you're putting into practice something that, that I as a scientist have, have concluded is relevant, that is gratifying. Indeed, it's one of my hopes as a scientist. There's nothing more frustrating than thinking you have the answer to relevant questions but not having a way to share that answer with other people. In fact, that was when, you know, about three or four years ago, when I got involved in social media, it was in no way to be self-aggrandizing. That's why I don't post pictures of myself doing workouts or even pictures of myself eating. I didn't ever want it to be about me. And because I hate that kind of attention, um, I, I wanted simply to have a platform for sharing answers to questions that I knew people had that, that I couldn't as a scientist. And so uh, again, my point where you have a practitioner, someone who's on the front lines or where the rubber meets the road, like what you're doing, where you can take some of the insight that a scientist has found and, and put it into practice. That is wonderful because I, I'm, I don't do that. I, I am simply the guy who's putting some fuel in the engine, but there still has to be that point of, well, the vehicle's not going to move if, there aren't, if the wheels aren't on the ground. We need that and and you're playing that part and I'm glad for that. Well, we're grateful to be getting the information from people like you who are just looking for answers. I mean, we don't we yeah. don't care what people eat. I'm not paid whether you eat a steak or whether you eat cereal. I don't care. Yeah. But I do care if you lose fat the way you want to or or reverse some of these chronic conditions. So, we just have to find, yep. you know, what works best. As far as insulin resistance goes, here's an analogy I like to use and you can tell me if this this works or not. Let's say I I drink a beer and I get a buzz. And then a month Mm -hmm. later, I don't get a buzz anymore. So now I need to drink two or three beers. And then a month later, I need to drink more and more and more. And one day I come to you, Ben, and I say, dude, I am drinking like 12 beers a night. I'm not getting a buzz anymore. What should I do? 
and you say, oh, well, here's a bottle of Jack Daniels. You should drink this and you'll get a buzz. Yep. Yep. <laughs> is yep. that a fair analogy, especially related to type 2 diabetes? That's a perfect analogy. Yeah. So, so uh, it, it's insulin. Res- one of the key causes of insulin resistance is chronically elevated insulin. And, and you're, you're describing it in a perfect analogy. And the, the fundamental truth underlying both of these instances, whether it's chronic alcohol exposure leading to alcoholism or whether it's chronic insulin exposure leading to insulin resistance, the theme of it is when cells are exposed to an incessant stimulus they will start to reduce their sensitivity to that stimulus. So in other words, if there's too much of something, then the body will start to reduce its sensitivity to that something. And we see this in all ways in life, whether it's, you know, someone's been listening to music too loud and they get, they become deaf. Now, all of a sudden, ironically, they can't hear the music as well. If they've been exposing themselves to some illicit substances like say alcohol or caffeine or other, you know, harder drugs, they need more and more of that substance to get the response that, they, that they're seeking. The same thing goes with hormones. And, and insulin is a prime example. Chronically elevated insulin will be contributing to insulin resistance. Now, I'm not going to be so bold to say it's the only factor. Indeed, I, I don't. I believe there are other relevant factors. But I feel strongly that insulin is a, a primary part of what's driving insulin resistance. Namely, someone is eating a diet that is, well, basically it's high in refined starches and sugars and they're eating every two hours because they've been told to eat six meals a day. And that is a wonderful way to keep insulin elevated every, literally every waking moment of the day and even well into the night. That will drive insulin resistance. Mm, interesting. So if we go back to the alcoholic analogy, what would be a wiser thing to tell that person? So the wiser analogy, rather than saying, well, let's just give you something harder, it would be take a break, um, take a break from it. And of course, easier said than done in the case of the alcoholic, and maybe easier, easier said than done in the case of the carbohydrate addicted type two diabetic. Um, uh, it, evidence is growing, uh, incidentally, that there is in fact a, an addiction to carbohydrates, including publication just very recently, finding that people are not addicted to fat in any way. Uh, it's, it's the carbohydrate that they're addicted to. And we see this in practice. No one is sitting around on a Saturday night or a Friday night about to watch an episode of the Mandalorian. And they say, oh man, I sure would love a plate of scrambled eggs. No, no, they want something salty and crunchy like chips or crackers or something or, or sweet and gooey, um, like ice cream. That is going to be carbohydrate. Sure. It might have fat in it too, no doubt. And fat and carbohydrate together is, is a wonderful, magical, toxic mix, but Regardless, the solution in the case of insulin resistance is turn it down, turn down the the volume here, let give the body a break, give the cells a break from the incessant insulin, and all of a sudden they will become more insulin sensitive. Mm. Are carbohydrates the only thing that increase uh, insulin production? Yes, in, in general, yes. Uh, so if we look across the three macronutrients, carbohydrate, protein, and fat, um, carbohydrates are without a doubt the greatest um, stimulus of insulin. But of course, that, that it encompasses a tremendous range. Uh, and, and, and I would want anyone to know that when I'm speaking about the benefits of a low-carb diet, uh, I am in no way attempting to e- uh, equalize broccoli with uh, a donut. Uh, so there are, there's a, an enormous um, spectrum of what a carbohydrate will do to insulin. In general, grains, and, and sugars, of course, will have a significant effect, and vegetables and certain fruits will have a modest effect. That's the general theme at the risk of you know needing to get into more detail. Protein will have a modest effect. When protein is consumed on its own, like pure whey, it can have a less, a, a more than modest effect where it can be pretty um, uh, quite consequential likely. And I think what's relevant there, and, and it, maybe I'll finish this and just say fat has no effect. There are some people who say, well, fat does. And there is a limited evidence to show that. Uh, and, and the evidence, the studies that show that there is a statistical increase in insulin with fat, it's when the person has consumed about five to 600 calories of fat. And then the little insulin curve at about two hours is statistically significant but it's, I would argue it's meaningless where it goes from like five microunits per mil up to eight microunits per mil. And, and so that the, the statistician says, oh, well, that reached a significant level. And I, as a physiologist would say, yeah, but that's not meaningful. 
But nevertheless, I'm going to be bold to say there's gen- essentially no effect to insulin on fat or response to fat. Uh, and then protein, there can be. But if you eat that protein with fat, the insulin effect is significantly um, reduced. Uh, uh, and, and I think that's relevant because in nature, God designed, uh, and, and indeed I'm a very religious person, so I am going to be bold to say it that way, but if that offended someone, they would just say nature. Um, but I will, I'm not pagan, so I'm not going to say mother nature. I will say God designed um, proteins to come with fat. And in nature, they do. All of the best proteins, or, or literally every protein, literally every protein comes with fat. And the best proteins for humans are undoubtedly the animal-based proteins. Uh, And I I do mean that very objectively, quantifiably. Animal proteins beat any plant protein um, in in the world. And, And that is eggs, meat, and dairy. They are the best protein sources for humans. This has been quantified. There's no, there should be no debate on that. Those all come with fat. And so my sentiment with regards to protein is eat it with fat. It's how it's supposed to be. Protein is not supposed to come alone. When we eat protein with fat, the the combination of those two allows us to digest the fat, uh, sorry, to digest the protein better because of the fat that has been shown. Uh, and protein and fat are more anabolic than protein alone. That was a fascinating study that had uh, people working out and they quantified the degree to which the muscles made new protein, had them, uh, in other words, got bigger, um, with muscle protein, then they had the people eat a load of protein, the best, which was egg white, and they measured protein um, growth, uh, muscle growth. Uh, and then they had them eat egg white with an egg yolk, which is this, what I consider a divine ratio of one to one of protein to fat by mass. And, and, the, pro- and the muscles got bigger still than the protein alone. So as if you have, you know, when I imagine people listening to this and they're so interested in getting enough protein, which I applaud. I think that is good. We should be prioritizing protein. It's one of what I consider to be the pillars of a smart diet, but you must get it with fat. Don't artificially get protein alone. So I would even say, don't just scoop out a scoop of whey protein. That's not the way you're supposed to get it. If you are going to get whey protein from a supplement, which I think is fine, get it with fat. In fact, at the risk, I I am a little reluctant in stating this because I wouldn't want someone to think I I'm anything but a scientist, but but I am a little more than a scientist. It was my frustration with pure or or heavily protein skewed protein shakes as meal replacement shakes that I in fact designed my own. And, and I will just say this: anyone who wants to learn more, go to gethealth.com. And health is spelled H L T H. And and basically, this was a meal replacement shake that was built on a pillar of one to one protein to fat. And so, you know, the best proteins, egg whites and whey, and that matched with uh, some of the best fats, uh, mostly from fruit fats, just because they're more stable. Um, and that was coconut and olive mm. and a little bit of ghee. Awesome. Nevertheless, that's that little infomercial is done. But <laughs> when people focus on protein and fat, focus on if you want to prioritize protein, do it. That's great. But let the fat come with it the way God intended. Our bodies are, are built to take it that way. Mm, I love that. No, that's great. Um, we will be sure to link that in the show notes. Um, I want to go back to something you said. I am about, I don't know, 30 miles north of you right now um, in, in mm-hmm. the valley to the north, both in Utah, practicing distancing. I look outside and I yeah. don't see many things growing right now. It's really cold. <laughs> I'm kind of bundled up. And I, I look out on the land and I don't see many things growing. I don't see fruit. I don't see vegetables. Yeah. I don't see the wonderful tomatoes I had a few months ago. Everything's kind of sleeping. And so I think let's go back 10,000 years and look at this valley and say, where am I going to find my food? And you're right. My only shot at finding food this time of year is going to be hunting animals. And they are going to come with fat and protein, but carbohydrates are going to be exceedingly rare. I, I may not mm-hmm. come across them for many months. Yet in the summertime, I might find a lot of them for a very short period of time. Can you explain how that was beneficial for us as we evolved? Yeah, no, absolutely. In fact, I, I, I like that you're seeing the world that way. I do think there are some perhaps lessons we learn, um, or we can, we can learn or relearn 
by by wondering how our ancestors might have lived. Not that we're going to attempt to replicate all that. We, no one would want to. Now, I of course, I'm not an anthropologist, so I, I'm not a, a scientist of sort of human history and changes over time. But I, I would say here, certainly in the arid conditions of Utah, but even the same would apply in less arid places like in Texas, where I was down in Houston. That's a lush area but you just don't find plants spontaneously growing edible foods. The vast, vast majority of all plants in the world are completely inedible. In fact, indeed, if we try to eat them, we become sick. And if we persisted in continuing to eat, we persisted in eating them, we would die. The vast majority of plants are, are not um, consumable for humans or even most animals. And the fact that we have as many plants as we do right now is because we have scientific, we've bred them to be edible. We have, we've bred them to, to, you know, to uh, exaggerate what we want and to and minimize these molecules that we don't want, including molecules that are getting, that people are getting a lot of when they're getting their plant-based proteins that are physically inhibiting their intestines ability to digest the very proteins they're eating. Plants, in a way, I don't mean this to sound dramatic, but they fight back by putting chemicals in them to discourage us from wanting to eat them. So uh, around us, if we were hunter-gatherers, we would most certainly find some success. And, and I believe around here, much of that would be, um, you know, random berries um, and and maybe some some tuberous, uh, you know, roots that we could eat. And, and, and maybe a few more and, and just... The, undoubtedly, the, and I can't speak to them just because I'm not familiar enough with that area of research. So there, we would be able to get some plants, um, and many of them would become ripe towards the end of summer and early fall. And so even in the spring, for example, or even in the middle of the summer, most, although if, if you have your own garden, in fact, I want you tell me, I haven't had a garden since I was a boy, I, nothing is coming ripe in the summer, right? Or maybe towards the end of summer, yeah, that's when you get those great tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So this would be like July, August. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I haven't gardened in a few years either, but um, my friends have, and I still get yeah. tomatoes every now and again. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, but that's my point, though, is that there, there are, there's a significant time where, well, regardless, even then, even in the summer when things would be full bloom, we I, I, undoubtedly, I, I am just convinced, our ancestors would have still been heavily reliant on animal-based foods. These, these, these sources of carbohydrates, which are, are fine, that's wonderful, I have no problem with them, um, they would have almost always been a, a bonus. You know, in other words, hey, look, we got some berries, that's awesome. Let's add them to the meat that we're eating or whatever, it's, it's dessert after the meat. But humans, there is, there, it, it makes me very curious how people could claim that humans are not omnivores we are or even more carnivore than we are herbivore a human cannot cannot live on plants alone that is a diet that is incompatible with human survival now someone's saying well i know a vegan or i'm a vegan and i can do it uh, veganism if it if someone is surviving on it is a privilege of the elite this is a person who must know what nutrients they are deficient in because they will absolutely be deficient in nutrients. So they have to have a sufficient level of education to know that. And second, they have to have a significant, a sufficient level of wealth to afford the supplements um, that they're missing. That's a really Fine. good point. That is a person who can survive on a vegan diet. So humans are not herbivores. However, you can take a human that is living on nothing but a carnivore, a carnivorous diet, and they will survive perfectly fine. Uh, and I mean it. There will be no nutritional deficiencies. So we have, we can live as carnivores, and, and, and but but we but we can also um, um, subsist perfectly fine with plants in our diet. So we are omnivores. We're built that way. And so I think that it's it's comfortable to just say we're omnivores and leave it at that. But back to your sort of initial. Um, sentiment, uh, our ancestors would have certainly enjoyed carbohydrates whenever they could get them. But thankfully, carbohydrates are not essential um, to the human survival. There are such things as essential fats. There are such things as essential amino acids, and we get them all in any source of animal foods. And there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. 
nothing, zero zilch. There's absolutely nothing essential about it. All this focus on polyphenols and plant metabolites like resveratrol and you know whatever, that's all fun. That's all neat stuff, but humans do not need it to survive. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't eat them, therefore. I'm not saying that, but I am saying, I guess, don't let that be the focus of your diet. The one macronutrient that is not essential and coincidentally happens to have the biggest effect on insulin. Focus on the two macronutrients that are essential and coincidentally have the least effect on insulin. Interesting. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. I want to go. I want to go back to something you mentioned. I want to go back in time. I think it was either 2017 or 2018. I had been working measuring people's metabolisms in a lab um, at my gym for several years. I started to notice an interesting phenomenon where people who were eating a low carb, possibly ketogenic diet, they would come in for a test where we would measure their resting metabolic rate, the number of calories mm -hmm. where they need just to stay alive, and. I would see the results and across the board, I would notice the people who are eating a low carbohydrate diet would have metabolisms that were hundreds of calories higher than what the average should have been for somebody their age, height, weight, and gender. And I would mm -hmm. say to them, wow, like your metabolism is super high. So you need to eat this many calories at a minimum every single day, or your metabolism is going to slow down. And they would look at me and say, dude, I can't, do you want me to eat Twinkies and cereal? Like that's the only way I'm going to yeah, be able to get yeah. to that number of calories. And that was never really explained until you did an interview on high intensity health with uh, Dr. Uh, Mike Mutzel. He also asked you yep. to speculate on why that might be evolutionarily. And you had a similar answer where you said, look, I'm not an anthropologist, but I'm going to speculate and say that if I were a hunter gatherer and I didn't get food one day, I would need to be more sharp, more alert, have better energy the next day so that I could be a better hunter that day. And that could be a possible mechanism. And I remember exactly where I was driving. I pulled right off the road and re-listened to that like three or four times until it sunk in. That's pretty remarkable. Can you explain some of that? Yeah, well, geez, I'm, I'm, that's, that's nice to hear that it had such an impact. Mind you, that was an answer to, I totally just pulled out of thin air. Uh, uh, but it 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 seems justified, which is why I said it. So I, I'm always quick to say when I don't actually know the answer, I will say, well, let me, let me speculate. And so that was definitely one of those times where it was, but I would say it's speculation with some information. You know, I'm not doing it totally um, uh, without being with it, with no familiarity of the topic. Yeah. So um, first of all, that that's fascinating. I'm fascinated to hear um, what you had been seeing in practice, which is that a low carb diet elicits a significant increase in energy expenditure or metabolic rate. In fact, a, a study was just published today, once again, finding the same thing in humans, that if someone has low insulin or adheres to a low carb diet or a ketogenic diet, metabolic rate is accelerated to the eat potentially about 300 calories a day higher. That is a significant amount of energy. You know, I think you'd have to You'd have to do the stair stepper for like an hour or something to, to get to about 300 <laughs> calories. No, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah, I don't want to do that. Um, uh, so I'd rather just eat a low carb diet. Um, I, I do think one, so, so we have found in my own lab two interesting observations um, across um, cell, animal, and human studies that when insulin is up, it slows down metabolic rate in our fat cells. It's basically stimulating the fat cells to store more energy. Don't waste a thing, store it. And that's reflective of the, the, the theme of insulin that I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, which is insulin tells cells what to do with energy. Insulin abhors wasting energy. It wants the body to store it. So it tells the fat cells, hey, it's time to go into miser mode, store energy. Now, it could be doing other things to other cells too. We just happen to look at the fat cells. In contrast, when ketones come to fat cells, they stimulate the fat cells to waste energy. They will, it, it creates this situation called mitochondrial uncoupling. And basically the analogy that I use in describing that is if someone imagines driving a stick shift car, a standard transmission where they got the three pedals. Now, of course, anyone who's under the age of 20 wouldn't have any idea what I'm talking <laughs> about. Uh, but, you know, maybe they would because they saw their grandpa driving <laughs> that archaic machine. So it would be like the person has the clutch in, they're pressing the clutch, but they're pressing the gas. And so the RPMs are revving up, but the speed isn't. They're not actually moving. They've uncoupled 
the, the movement of the engine from the movement of the car. In contrast, in, so they're wasting energy. They're waste, literally wasting energy from, from the fuel. In, in contrast, insulin pushes it the other way. It makes the mitochondria more tightly coupled. So now the clutch is up. And now as they are depressing the accelerator, you are increasing the RPMs and you are increasing the movement of the car. You've coupled, you're not wasting energy anymore. You are getting action from it. You're moving, you're doing something with it. So back to the fat cell, when ketones are up, the fat cell is wasting energy. That might sound like a bad thing, but if, you, if you're talking about someone who's overweight, that's a perfect thing. Now they have this outlet for all that energy they're storing in their big fat cells. And insulin has come down, allowing the ketones to come up. And, and the combination of those, low insulin, high ketones, is very likely both playing a factor here. But now you've accelerated your metabolic rate in your fat cells by about two or three times. And now your fat cells are working for you to control their own size, to stimulate uh, the use of what they've been storing. So this is uh, part of this then could be what you saw and, and what people are seeing in the biomedical literature, namely an actual whole body increase in metabolic rate. But it all starts at the level of those little humble mitochondria, whether they are wasting energy or whether they are being miserly with their energy. And there's an interesting thing there, Ryan, though, people or Casey, um, so people, sometimes you'll hear a little radio ad and people will say, take this supplement or do this, whatever, low t uh, this testosterone treatment or whatever, and it'll make your metabolism more efficient. Well, you don't want that, actually. <laughs> if someone's trying to lose weight, they would rather their metabolism be inefficient because then it's wasting energy, which you want. Importantly, we did not see this happen at muscle cells. Muscle cells are not wasting energy. It's the fat cells that are doing it. So in a way, if someone has fat to lose, it's their greatest hope that their, you know, so-called metabolism would be less efficient. So don't, don't, uh, when we hear a radio ad saying all that kind of nonsense, don't buy into it. Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. Mm. I love that analogy. And I want to go back to it for a second because you've got the clutch down, you've got the gas down, you're not moving anywhere, but that engine is getting yep. hot. That's really important. And that's related yep. to brown yep. fat. That's literally creating yep. heat and warmth as a byproduct of wasting that energy. Right. And so back to your um, um, example earlier of our earlier ancestors in a colder climate, it, it does to a degree, it defies reason to say, well, wait, if I am going hungry right now, why would I want to be wasting energy? I need to store it. And I do think in the long term, that would be a problem. Although in the long term, there would be other hormones that would start to fight that like cortisol, you would start to have genuine stress hormones that would start to undo some of that wasting where cortisol is, is to a degree also having the body store energy as fat. But in the short term, I think an advantage certainly to our, you know, to any, it wouldn't be our ancestors, of course, living in Utah eons ago, you know, in this area, of course, Native Americans, but anyone, our ancestors living in a cold climate, say in Scandinavia um, or, or Northern Europe, uh, it, there would have been an advantage because if they are in ketosis, they will be warmer uh, in, in that colder climate when they are forced to rely on animal foods in the absence of available plant foods. Um, they would be in ketosis basically every minute of the winter and that will help them be warmer. So there, there could be that advantage if we're trying to see a reason why the body is doing what it's doing now. And I, I emphasize the word why, because I, that's an interesting um, departure from typical science. You know, for example, my role as a scientist is to answer the question, how, how are ketones or, or what is happening? It's a how and a what, you know, what is happening to metabolic rate when someone's in ketosis and how is it happening? I can answer those questions directly. But when we answer, when we kind of ask a why question, well, why would the body be doing that? And like I just attempted to answer with my speculation, we can only speculate because as I like to joke with my students, the, the, those, those are divine questions. By that, I mean, we ask the, the, the person who designed these human bodies, that's a, that's a God question where we would say to God someday, why did you design the body this way? He would have an answer, undoubtedly. We can only humbly attempt to answer that with some speculation. Mm. So that's a why question, and I answered it with my humble speculation. That's Yeah, that's a really fair point, and I like that. So 
to kind of sum it up, like when the system is working, you eat the most nutrient dense foods, which are fats and proteins. Sometimes in the year, yep. you find carbohydrates. When you do, they are temporary. Your insulin goes up. You are probably going to be storing fat. Then there's a period of time where it gets colder. There's no more or, or significantly less carbohydrate on the land. So now insulin levels fall because you're not eating them. So now you're burning the fat that you have already stored for that purpose to get you through winter. And in that state, you will actually be warmer and more energetic because of it. When the system is broken, we flood the food system with all kinds of carbohydrates that are available for you for your Saturday night Mandalorian watching. And yep. we eat them all day, every day for a week, for a month, for a year, for 10 years, for 20 years, for 30 years. And we have all these diseases that we never used to have or had greatly reduced amount of them. And mm -hmm. they all come from the same issue. Yeah. 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 Well said. In fact, there is a reflective of what you're saying. There's a guy on Twitter, which I actually don't visit as often as I used to as Twitter is becoming increasingly a cesspool, but he, he, <laughs> I loved, I loved his sentiment where his, his handle on Twitter, and I wish I could remember his name. It was basically, I think it was don't eat for winter. Mm. And it was this sentiment that you're expressing. Don't put your body into this position where it's thinking constantly that it needs to be storing energy to prepare for a period of fasting, basically, you know, a hard, cold winter. So don't eat for winter was his, his, his central message. And I, I think there's something very profound in the simplicity of that statement where, where nowadays our modern diet allows us to mimic what perhaps our ancestors would have only experienced in brief moments in the in say the late summer and or in fall preparing for winter like a bear you know starting to load up and and uh, for for hibernation you know of course we're not we're not that kind of animal but i still think there's something relevant in that sentiment that we don't want to be putting our bodies into a position of uh, where it, we're forcing it to store energy we want it to use energy or at least be at an equal level of of using it as much as it's, you know, inclined to store it. And we do that truly by keeping insulin under control. Someone might think I'm, I bring up insulin too readily and too, too liberally, but when it does come to energy use, insulin controls those levers with profound precision and power. If insulin is up, the body stops burning fat tremendously and, 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 and will literally reduce metabolic rate to store energy. When insulin is down, the body will shift to predominantly burning fat and will then be using more energy, um, using what it has stored. It's now, it's breaking it down and burning it. Mm, that's so well explained. You also explain it so well in your book. Your book is wonderful. And one of the things I tell my guests um, who write things like you wrote is I really appreciate the fact that it goes into the science, but it's also easily understood. It's something that I can share with my clients and they can understand it. Yeah, that's great. And that Good. is so awesome. There's other books that are a little bit more complicated, go deeper into the science. And I, I love that too. And I appreciate that, but I really appreciate how you wrote the book so that people can understand it. Yeah, well, I'm thrilled to hear that. Uh, uh, frankly, it, it is a challenge in a way uh, where I, I may just be inclined to use uh, a vernacular or explain a process that n it's certainly not because I'm smarter. And that is such a, uh, I just really want to dispel that myth. Uh, uh, it, my knowledge of this material is in no way reflective of some kind of greater intelligence, not at all. And I wouldn't want anyone to look at someone with degree with letters after their name, reflective of some terminal degree and think, oh, they're so smart. No, they're not at all. They're no smarter than anyone else. They just simply had a, a passion for a topic that allowed them to be patient enough to earn a, a bigger degree or a later degree. So my familiarity with this is simply a matter of, of time, uh, the time I've spent focusing on it. And, and uh, I would, in fact, credit if I if I have developed a skill in conveying information, um, it would be in part, large part, perhaps, in, thanks to the students that I've had to teach. When you have to teach a bunch of 20 year olds uh, and uh, for four hours a week and you know that you're competing with Instagram or Facebook, which they might flip over to on their laptop at any moment, you've got to find compelling 
relevant, even occasionally entertaining ways to teach principles. Because I, I, I joke, but I do mean it. As a professor, I think part of my job is to teach an idea and compete with Instagram or Facebook, because at any moment they got their laptops flipped up. I know they could be not paying attention to a thing I'm saying and wasting their parents' money as their parents are paying their tuition and, and just be looking at Instagram or Facebook or Twitter rather than listening to, to me, what they're supposed to be doing. So anyway, all that saying, thanks. I'm saying, thanks. Uh, I'm glad if, uh, if I can convey information well, and then thanks to these 20 year olds who, who don't like to listen. <laughs> that's a really good point. As somebody that's followed you for many years, it, the book really matches what I, what I see and hear about you. It, it's dynamic. It's, it's exciting. It's, it really grabs you and it's very easy to understand. So I really appreciate that. Um, tell us a little oh, bit yeah, about um, Insulin IQ. Yeah. Yeah. Insulin IQ is something we started years ago. And, and in fact, it was kind of on the on the verge of just dying a, a miserable, unsuccessful life until we've, we've just rejuvenated it with a, with what is going to be an online coaching platform. So I, I'd mentioned, I kind of alluded to this earlier with the creation of the, the health code shake. Um, and it, it's, it's really um, my interest uh, in, in not just being a scientist or even a professor. I love having multiple irons in the fire. And I think it might be reflective of a, of a subtle level of, of ADD where I, I just don't like having only one thing I can focus on. You know, I like to focus on the research in the lab and then I get tired of it and I can focus on updating lectures for my class and I get tired of that. And then I can focus on doing something else. And part of this was finding practical ways to put, to help people um, apply the science in their lives. And, and, and Insulin IQ is an education platform. It is simply teaching people principles and providing coaching for them through what is now an online platform. Whereas before it, we were just trying to grow through local little wellness centers. And that just was, it was a painful process. So yeah, Insulin IQ is an education platform. Um, I, I contribute to that quite readily with the live sessions, as well as providing kind of the fundamental content um, that is used as the pillars of the coaching program too. And basically it's just a way for people that want to incorporate, well, what you are doing in a way, although not able, we're not doing it as much in person, but it's this idea of simply applying principles and helping people, well, helping people apply them with some information and some accountability, mm. both of which of course is tremendously valuable in actually um, helping someone change their behavior. For the listener right now, go to Facebook and go subscribe on Insulin IQ. The free live chats that you do there are wonderful. They're really, really oh, good. good. They're, they're dynamic. fun. They're, yeah, I'm glad. They, yeah, they're yeah. awesome. I really love them. Wow. Well, you're a busy guy. It sounds like all of this is going to take away from your family time. Is that correct? You rarely spend time with your family. You're never home. They're not yeah. a priority in your life. <laughs> no. Yeah, that would be... No, that would be terrible. Yeah. So, so in fact, really... Uh, truly, when I was an undergraduate student and I'd just gotten married, I was I was in my junior year, so I had one full year left. Um, I, I I sort of went through an early life crisis, and, and I I mean that actually, it was a tremendous source of anxiety for me. This realization that I am now a, a husband, and as my wife and I had discussed, I would be the primary breadwinner, and and that was something we had planned on on working that way uh, or having our relationship work that way. And it was a source of a lot of anxiety for me to think about how I would provide for our future family and, and to, to, to have security, stability, have an income and have time. And, and I saw my professors and I thought these guys and gals have a really good balance in life. They go down and play racquetball with their buddies or they're in the sauna for a little bit. They go home a little early or come in a little late. So the answer to your question is not at all. I am a family man first and foremost. So my responsibilities as husband and father absolutely trump everything else. And even today, I'll be out of here by about three o'clock when I get everything done. And I don't come in in the mornings until I've taken my kids to school. That's very, very rare. So I always make breakfast for the kids. And, and we, I, I bring them, I take them, drop some of them off at school and then come into work and I'm home typically a couple, well, nowadays it's a bit exception with the kids school, but I'm home well before dinner. 
um, just to help with homework and help get the dinner ready. And so, yeah, uh, so I, it's a great, great blessing. And I mean that I am incredibly fortunate to have a career that allows me to, to have freedom uh, where I can um, alter my schedule really however I want. And, and I can get work done very, very early in the morning. I can get some work done if I have to later in the evening when the kids are in bed and I've cleaned up the house. So I, I, do, I, I'm very sensitive to making sure that my family gets my best time and attention. I love that. When I was growing up in my household, we couldn't leave the dinner table until we had eaten all of our vegetables. Is the same rule uh, <laughs> active in your household with your kids? I've heard you answer this question before. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's not. Now, my wife, bless her heart. So, so thankfully, my wife is very much on board um, with the way I look at nutrition, which is you know, control carbohydrates, prioritize protein, fill with fat. She's very much in favor of that, which means we are very much in favor of meat and eggs. But she still loves vegetables in a way that I don't necessarily. So she will still make broccoli, for example, and say, you got to eat the broccoli. And I don't say that at all, but, but I certainly support my wife's sentiment. But I strongly say, you got to eat your meat. You know, and, and I'll say, I don't care if you eat your broccoli, eat your meat because that is the food for growth. That is what's going to help a kid grow big and strong and keep them that way. So we definitely have flipped that paradigm around as, a, you know, the convention with most homes, eat your vegetables. Um, when the parents, if they had meat on the plate at all, they don't really care. I am, I definitely flipped that around. I am much, a much stronger advocate of getting meat and, and real food. So even, even um, last night, we very rarely have cereal. It's typically a once a week phenomenon. Um, and, and yes, and we got some cereal yesterday, um, one little box that they would burn through in one day and, and they would eat that today for breakfast. But last night, my little boy said, Oh dad, could I have a little bowl of cereal? My little boy. And I said, sure, but you have to eat a beef stick first. And then, and then if my daughter wanted a bowl of cereal for her. Cause she doesn't like the beef stick. She has to eat a cheese stick. I just want them to have this sentiment that protein and fat are the foods we focus on. And all this other stuff is just fluff. A bowl of cereal that is not a meal, that is not nutrition, that is simply, that is truly just a treat and we treat it that way. These are treats, they are eaten rarely. They are not the basis of any meal in our home. I love that. That's awesome. We've had Jennifer Eisenhardt on the show. She created the film Fat Fiction. Uh, we've also interviewed mm -hmm. last week Dr. Mark Cucuzella. So the, mm -hmm. the listeners are familiar with a continuous glucose monitor and you've been experimenting with them. And one of the funniest videos I've seen this year is the video of you where you talk about oh, the, the bowl of cereal. cereal. <laughs> that was yeah. a great video. Oh. I've got two questions. Uh, the first question is about how long it took for your blood sugar to like come back after that trip. And the second question yeah. is, why did you choose mini wheats? There's so many other better cereals out there. <laughs> uh, well, so, so the, to answer the last question first, you're wrong. Mini wheats are like <laughs> are are like manna from heaven. But but of course, I just love them. I irrationally love them. And so I'd convinced my kids that that should be the cereal we get for the week because they feel more like you do, which is dad, this isn't that great. I just love them. And I just cracked that night. I had two not even that massive bowls, but two good sized bowls of mini wheats. And it took me of of straight fasting it took me about 18 hours to get back down to about the 90s with my blood glucose. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And indeed, I felt sufficiently compelled to just, and that was one of the rare moments, I confess, where I did sort of allow some insight into my personal life, which again, I don't really like. But I just thought, this is so, it's so funny. And, and yet, hopefully shocking, where people would think, whoa, this is not a benign food. Because even a guy like me, I'm lean, I've no um, risk of really of type two diabetes. And it really dragged on me uh, metabolically. And imagine if someone eats that for their evening snack, like I did, they eat it something similar again for breakfast, again for their mid morning snack, again for lunch, et cetera, et cetera. They are living every waking moment with hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia. That is a wonderful way to get fat and sick. Yep. I agree. Well, it was both very informative, very shocking, and very funny. So <laughs> way to ride that yeah, line. Yeah, good. Um, what are you passionate about these days and what what's in the future for you? Yeah, I, I am. My, my passion is generally the same that it ever was, which is finding more effective ways to um, provide insight and solutions to poor metabolic health. 
uh, yeah, that, so that hasn't changed. I love that. We normally ask our, our guests a few different questions. I'm going to ask you a slightly different one. Normally we'll ask, what's one thing you want somebody to take away from this conversation? But for you, I am going to build a giant tower and I'm going to make you climb up to the top. You're a healthy guy. You're passionate. You're excited. I want you to scream the message that you would like to scream on that tower to the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. My, 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 my message, if, if I, at the end of my career, um, want to be known for any one thing, it would be that the sooner we insert insulin into conversations about health and disease, the better we will detect diseases and the better we will treat them. So a takeaway for a listener is insofar as you can get your insulin measured to find out where you stand with regards to insulin resistance, because any other marker isn't going to tell you that even glucose won't tell you that. Mm. And for the listener, uh, Ben's book, Why We Get Sick, is fantastic. It talks not only about all the different conditions that can get addressed when you lower your insulin, but it's also a very helpful and very practical um, guide as to what you can do to be able to do that. So I really appreciate that you you added those things in there. Where can people find you and where can they find your work and your book? Yeah. Thanks again, Casey. What a fun time. So I I am moderately involved in social media. I try to do about a post a week. Um, And again, that's almost completely just me sharing insight into human metabolism. I'm I'm more active on Instagram. So if anyone's on Instagram, I'd say find me there. And that's Ben Bickman. And Bickman is just B-I-K-M-A-N, no C, Ben Bickman, Ph.D., Um, that's the same handle, I think on Facebook where I just sort of allow the Instagram to kind of feed over to that. And I'm not as involved on Twitter as much anymore. And that's, but that's still the same handle. Um, I contribute blog content and of course designed the shake that people can find at get health and that's H L T H get health.com. And then like we'd mentioned earlier, I do live stream content, which is just sort of a fun time to share more science. Um, which involves some Q and A's. So people, by all means, submit some questions there. And that's at, uh, at Insulin IQ on that Facebook group. And then there's the Insulin IQ website where you can find it there too. Mm. Well, that's awesome. We will definitely link to all of that in the show notes. I highly, highly encourage our listeners to go there, take advantage of Ben's information because it's very good and it's extremely important, especially in today's day and age. Dr. Benjamin Bickman, this is an absolute honor. Like I said before, I have been looking forward to speaking with you for years and so appreciate your work and content and really appreciate you appearing here today with us. So thank you very, very much. We're really grateful for you. Uh, Casey, my pleasure. Truly, uh, this was a fun conversation. We covered some relevant stuff and I think any, uh, any of your listeners can feel good that they've learned something valuable. I think so too. This is great. And thank you very much. This is another episode of Boundless Body Radio.